Hello everyone, welcome back to my dream world. I would first like to apologize if my voice sounds deeper or weirder because I currently have a sore throat and I'm hoping that it is not COVID. So, okay, but enough about me. Here's the episode for today. I am back with another episode of Nostalgia Trip with one of my absolute favorite childhood shows and shows in general. As some of you may know, if you are a fan of Ninjago, the newest season, Crystallize, will be airing soon. And in fact, some of the episodes are already out. So I decided it's the perfect time to do a full rewatch. I'm gonna admit, it's been a while since I've done a full rewatch of Ninjago, so let's get on to it. If you haven't watched the first Nostalgia Trip of My Little Pony season one, I'll explain it here. I'm going to be comparing how I felt as a child about the show and how I react to it now and walk through like why my feelings have changed or why they haven't and just overall thoughts of each episode as well. If this does not interest you or if you've not seen season one of Ninjago, I recommend you either watch it or maybe this video just isn't for you and that's cool. So for this episode, I'm gonna be talking about the pilot and the first season, Rise of the Snakes and how my opinions have changed or developed or remain the same. I'll probably also split this up into several different parts if it goes over a certain amount of time because I have a lot to say. So I hope you enjoy. The intro alone has already hit me with a huge wave of nostalgia. Like I feel like I just got hit by a bus. But while in terms of quality, the pilot is more about setting up the characters and the mood of the show, I think it holds up pretty nicely and is a good introduction. Because right off the bat, we get an idea of what the characters are like, and it's interesting to compare how they change throughout the series if you've seen it. Um, Kai is hot-headed, impatient, very impulsive, but is protective of Nia. Nia is his younger sister and is much more capable than she is given credit for in the beginning. So it's interesting to see how she kind of like shows that off. Sensei Wu, the sensei, the master, is a wise old man with a mythical combat skills and metaphors and lingo that are confusing for short-minded teenagers and bony dunderheads. Also, why the heck did the villagers cheer when the Skullkin first appeared? Did they think they were being saved or something? Oh well, I digress. The, the Skullkin are not very fleshed out villains at all and they're very stupid. I mean, they literally clap after Kai kicks one of their heads over the roof of the blacksmith shop. But I think that's okay. They're not meant to be long lasting characters that we get to know and love or anything. They're just meant to be there to kind of like give us an introduction of what the who the ninja are and like what their powers are capable of. And then we go into our intro about Ninjago itself, the first Spinjitzu master, four weapons of Spinjitzu, hiding the weapons, and Kai's upcoming role in this mission, and who our main enemy is, Lord Garmadon, who is also Sensei Wu's older brother. The music absolutely slaps during the scene and throughout the entire series, and I will stand by that. But then we go into the iconic training montage with, again, super nostalgic and memorable music. Kai fails miserably at first. But he gets better and better each time and eventually he figures out a trick on how to get through it and basically smacks Sensei Wu's tea out of his hand before he can finish it and then completes the training course. And I just realized that if Kai only gets one chance to try each day like Sensei Wu implies in the beginning, it took him about a week. Which I guess actually is kind of impressive because that training course is pretty crazy. So it, it, a lot of inner potential showing there. And, and then he comes to his final test where three more characters are introduced or at least shown because they mess up some of the designs throughout the scene. This is common occurrence throughout the earlier seasons, but despite being in a three versus one, Kai actually manages to hold his own though he eventually gets overwhelmed. And the three are revealed to be Sensei Wu's other students. And I'll start by expressing my initial opinion of each one. Okay, you're gonna hear an eight-year-old perspective here, so give me a break. As an eight-year-old, I immediately thought that Cole was the cutest, but I also thought that he was too serious and rough around the edges. But like, now that I kind of can absorb more as a, as a teenager, I can see like, he's a strong leader 
And even though he's focused and stoic, he has a really good heart and hardworking spirit. Because despite just being in a fight with Kai, he immediately says, Nice to meet you, kid. I got your back. This is a more, I, I would say, in, at least for me, an older brotherly and protective side of him, which is fit for at least he's currently the leader of the team. As you may have figured out, I am a Cole stan, but that wasn't always the case, so it's kind of interesting how that, that happened. Um, I'll get into that in later episodes. I, I also thought that Jay was cute, but like a silly or creative, quirky kind of cute. And I feel similarly about this now. Jay has stayed pretty consistent throughout the series, so like my opinion of him has always been positive and never really like wavered. I have always loved Zane. As soon as he took off his hood, I thought, oh my gosh, his head looks like a cake, and I've stanned him ever since. His innocence yet intelligence was so refreshing in a character for an eight-year-old me. At the beginning, he's really wholesome, and I like his more serious and cool-headed energy, and he helps make the team dynamic so enjoyable. Um, I would also like to mention that I adore all of the ninja, so if it sounds like I'm dissing one of them, just know it's all in good fun, because I genuinely enjoy all of them. But then we get into the scene where they go after the side of the quakes, and we get a goofy yet endearing, endearingly entertaining sneak scene where the ninja have to evade the Skulkin, and they eventually reach their first obstacle, and we get our first showing of Spinjitsu from one of the ninja. I remember being surprised that Jay was the first one to figure out Spinjitsu, but it honestly makes sense, because he's the most willing to go outside of the box and was able to weave his training into his current situation, which is pretty cool. Like, go you, Jay. Um, while the ninja drive the Skulkin away and Cole gloats about his muscles, which I definitely did not understand as a child, by the way, they get a little bit of a scare. The first guardian of one of the weapons, aka a dragon. And Zane actually makes a joke. The ninja do escape and brag about their achievements, but they get a scolding from Sensei Wu and throw Kai under the bus. Garmadon, however, seems to be perfectly fine with the turnouts of events when he's confronted by the Skulkin leader, Samukai, despite the ninja getting the scythe and learning Spinjitsu. Right away, Garmadon is intriguing, at least to me, and I didn't quite, quite realize why as a kid, but the fact that we don't see his face yet, apart from a short viewing from a past event, it leaves a lot of room for imagination, which I think keeps younger kids very engaged because it's like oh my gosh who, who is this like who's the bad guy we want to see the bad guy so it kind of like causes this like suspension and then we are on to the next episode first thing that caught my attention in the second part of the first episode it depends on how you watch them but like the second part is that sensei wu is talking about the tornado of creation and says it, that it creates something out of nothing I don't believe this to be true, at least in most future cases, and I'm going to get into that at the end of the pilot. But after retrieving the shuriken, I started laughing my face off because... Ow. I wish the shurikens of ice and especially the nunchucks of lightning were highlighted a little bit more, but I get that they're kind of on a time crunch, so I'll let it slide. But the other two weapons definitely get more focus, which is kind of annoying, but whatever. The next scene honestly plays rent free in my head, so I'll just play my favorite parts here. Shake what your mama gave you. Yeah, look at this one now. Mm. Ooh, yeah. Also, are my two babies are my two babies actually smiling during this scene? Oh. I love them. Okay, almost immediately, even as an eight-year-old, I knew that something was off about Nia when she kind of shows up in front of Kai and is like, follow me. But the Garmadon reveal is pretty cool. And it shows how he can manipulate Shadow to make a false image, hence the name of the episode, King of Shadows. I also just realized that when Garmadon says, forgot something, like, I'll insert that, I guess. Kai is reaching for his sword and can't find it. This is why I love re-watching shows, because you catch a lot of things that you didn't catch the first time. That's probably pretty obvious, but I didn't catch it. Uh, I also find that it's cute that even though when Kai and Nia are really in trouble right now, Nia still roasts him and they get into these 
like sibling argument. It just it's just funny. Also, younger me did not get why Kai was so upset when Sensei Wu sacrifices himself, quote unquote. Probably because it's pretty obvious that he's not actually gonna die. But I get why Kai reacts the way he does, because it does kind of look like he just disappears. But in the meanwhile, the other ninja try to keep the Skulkin from getting to the underworld, but aren't quite successful, and Jay gets smacked in the throat by Cole's scythe, which probably should have done way worse damage than it actually did. And Cole was weirdly calm about that. But although I can decipher words better now than I could 11 years ago, I can understand what Jay is saying despite his choked up voice, which is nice. But now, in the second part of the episode, Zane talks a lot about his senses. I wish that they were either highlighted more or explored more in later seasons, though perhaps this is because of a future realization that we will find out later. If y'all know the show, you know what I'm talking about. Their reactions to the fire dragon, however, are priceless, and Jay immediately decides to flirt with Mia, or at least attempt to. While the ninja get into the underworld, eight-year-old Mia almost immediately started screaming, and my Jay appreciation has grown because his attentive and so-called annoying screaming would have been helpful right about now. No thanks to you, Cole. But eventually, Jay regains his voice and proposes to try the tornado of creation. And knowing that it was their only shot, the other ninja are like, I bet, let's go. And this is where I disagree with Sensei Wu. They didn't win this battle by creating something out of nothing. They used their teamwork, which is definitely not nothing. And on top of that, their entire existing battlefield is what they end up using to trap the Skulkin. And that's a lesson you can take in real life because working with other people who support you can make the light bulb go off and then you can create something even better with what you already have. Wu and Samukai in the meantime duke it out and while Samukai manages to take the Sword of Fire, it kind of bites him in the butt because it eventually destroys him. Garmadon reveals to be an intelligent villain. He knew that with all four weapons, Samukai would try to betray him so he let him do the dirty work and accidentally destroy himself, which gives him the opening he needs to get out of the underworld. Sensei Wu suddenly gains an accent, but Garmadon makes his escape anyway, and he will return. So the ninja officially take up their mantles as Wu's students and Ninjago's protectors. The ninja return and reunite happily, ready to fight again another day. Overall, the pilot is good. Obviously, the story builds more and more. There are ups and downs, but I think this was a good start to one of my favorite shows, and there's a reason that I got hooked all those years ago. One thing I don't love about this iconic Ninjago intro is that my booby Cole isn't smiling. But I guess that's in character and he smiles later anyway, so I'll stop complaining now. Here's where I can start getting into the individual episodes of season one. At the beginning, it appears that the ninja are training, but it turns out that they are just playing video games. Yeah! <laughs> They've gotten cocky and it is soon revealed that they are not prepared to jump back into action, but luckily they don't have to deal with Lord Garbodon, but rather Lloyd Garbodon, his son, who is a joke, at least for now. But we do get a hint of who our upcoming villains are, the Serpentine, who up until now have been nothing but a legend. Also, not Zane being completely savage during this scene and buying all the candy. Talk about a G-rated middle finger. Then Kai proceeds to roast Jay with Cole's voice and the ninja kind of check out the scroll that they find that they accidentally took from Sensei Wu, which sets up a huge arc, the main arc, I would say. Who will be the legendary green ninja to defeat the Dark Lord? I'm gonna be honest, when I first watched this, I was 100% sure it was either gonna be Zayn or Mia. I'll touch on that a little more, but right now I'm kind of realizing there's no way it could be any of the main four. Because if you look, they're all in the scroll beside the green ninja. So unless they, for some reason, get replaced, how could it be one of them? Because it seems to be a separate person. But all that aside, the main story is now set up. Who's the green ninja? Who will defeat the Dark Lord? Who are the Serpentine? Well, we find that last one out almost immediately when Lloyd stumbles across one of the Serpentine tombs, more specifically the Hypnobri, who can hypnotize you into doing whatever they want. And with 
sheer dumb luck, Lloyd trips and manages to hypnotize the leader into working for him with, yeah, basically, he, it was an accident. Um, the ninja then try to fight each other to see who's the best and who's the most worthy of being the green ninja, and Cole wins. I'm gonna be honest, To he and Zane were both much more impressive than the other two, and that's not just my bias. Kai accidentally knocks Jay out, and Jay, like, multiple times zaps himself, while Cole and Zane actually showed a decent amount of control, but... It's clear that none of them have the finesse and control that they need to fight Garmadon, and Kai almost burns down the monastery. Sensei Wu was right for telling them off, to be honest. Like, I don't always agree with him, but he definitely had the right to tell them off for that. <laughs> but unfortunately, Lloyd gets to the Hypnobrite, and they raid the village for sweets, and now the ninja actually have to fight. And this time, they do show a lot of focus and don't fumble as much while getting there, but it's clear that their cockiness is still getting the best of them because they're not doing as well as they used to. And while they do manage to get the snakes to leave and retrieve the staff, Cole almost gets hypnotized. So Nia saves his butt and reminds him, dude, you have the staff, you need to free the village. <laughs> I forgot how, like, not, not stupid, but just like goofy the ninja are at the beginning of the show. I still love them though. And they learn their lesson. Deal with your problems while you're ahead, before they get worse. A good opening lesson for teenagers, nonetheless. And also, almost forgot that Scales wasn't the original leader of the Hypnobri. Almost forgot. Okay, all I'm gonna say about this episode is that eight-year-old me was ready to throw hands with all three of the ninja because Zane is absolutely adorable and didn't deserve any of their BS. And if you don't want to hear about me complaining, then skip ahead. The ninja appear ha to be learning their lesson and their training, but they don't seem to be too happy with Zane's quirkiness or uniqueness. I guess the reason why I was so defensive of Zane and still am is because I was and still am the weird one. I'm a writer with a crazy imagination, and I'm usually in my own little world, so I guess I understood Zane, and as such did not stand for the teasing because I knew the feeling, and Zane was always one of the kindest of the group, so I had a strong sense of sympathy for him. Alongside all this and the focus of the episode, Zane quickly became my favorite for a really long time, and we're not going to talk about how the Falcon scene low-key almost made me cry. I mean, to be fair, I'd follow a bird too if it copied my gift source, I'm just gonna be honest with that. And thanks to Zane, they do find the Hypnobrized Moon Lair, and they do almost defeat them, but Cole, who was almost hypnotized the episode before, gets fully hypnotized this time, and tries to fight the ninja, and they can't snap him out of it until Sensei Wu saves them with a sacred flute, which is the main weakness of the Serpentine. And it was... I think the next scene that really made me want to throw hands. They all blame Zane when they get back to the monastery and find it burned down. And honestly, props to Zane for keeping his cool, no pun intended, and not telling them off. Because I definitely would have. Scales proceeds to overthrow the Hypnobrite General, as he should honestly, because he's an icon. And can we just stand Zane for being so forgiving and making them an amazing dinner, even though the ninja kind of took a while to come to the realization that Zane is important to the team. Because honestly, I wouldn't have, especially not at the time, but it did inspire me to be a more forgiving person as a child. Because really, you shouldn't let petty feuds get in the way of what really matters. And while my perspective has changed, watching this episode reminds me of why this show holds such a special place in my heart and why I adore Zane. I'm probably not gonna talk as much about this episode because it sticks with me less, but here are my main talking points. The fact that the pen is so freaking big because of how Lego hands work is actually hilarious. But in all seriousness, I actually think that it's sweet that Jay's parents are so doting. While I do think I'd personally be annoyed by them, as Jay is, as a fellow adoptee, which is later revealed in the series, this Jay episode was relatable and made me feel sympathetic, though maybe to a slightly lesser degree than before. 
I understood his reaction throughout the episode. And also, I love the vampire and their accents. I did find it annoying that the ninja guilt tripped Jay into visiting his parents, but despite that, I'm glad that they did, because otherwise, Ed and Edna would be snakes and the junkyard would have gone completely insane. I'm actually really standing Jay right now, too. Like, go off. And Nia, too. Like, she straight up yeets a snake. And if there's anything Rapunzel has taught us, it's that frying pans are killer weapons. I know Jay is the goofy one, but I feel like his creative intelligence is seriously underrated. Like, his venting skills? Bravo. He made a freaking shit fly. Okay, I have a lot more to talk about right now. This is an episode that really sticks in my mind. Like, from Zane's opening dream sequence with the Falcon, Lord Garmadon, and the Green Ninja, I was hooked. Like, I'd like to note that simply observing the Green Ninja is another hint that it's a different character and not one of the ninja. I mean, look at his eyebrows. While the ninja acknowledged that the Green Ninja has traits that all four of them have, it only hints that the Green Ninja is something more, not an individual that we already know. Of course, as a child, this wasn't as obvious, but right now I'm screaming at my younger self. There has to be a clue that tells us which one of us is gonna be the Green Ninja. Oh, 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 hey! And poor Zane gets blamed again. What? Punishment? It was all Zane. Honestly, I actually love that Scales and Phantom just get chill with each other despite going into fight. And then we're introduced to one of Ninjago's most iconic villains, Pythor P. Chumsworth, who is also a really dark villain considering it's implied that he ate most of his fellow Anaconda and frankly considered eating Lloyd too. And who may you be, my little appetizer? Uh, I mean, Fred. Unlike a lot of the other snakes, Pythor is manipulating Lloyd from the very start, which sets him up as a much more vicious and competent villain. He's witty, charming, and kind of scary, at least compared to the other snakes. <laughs> That's one big snake. Lloyd's idea of evil at this point is getting what he wants, candy, and causing mischief. But this is child's play to Pythor, who has a much bigger idea of what true evil actually is. After being manipulated and betrayed by Pythor, Lloyd eventually realizes that he was in the wrong and is taken by the ninja, who learn to keep their hearts open to their enemies despite being adversaries. This is also another good lesson in real life too. Don't be a pushover, but sometimes a bit of kindness can go a long way. Now, this episode is where I feel like the plot starts kicking off, and after re-watching it many times, I do enjoy the overall lesson of this episode. Don't jump to conclusions, because the ninja almost get in a pretty bad fight, and probably would have if Sensei Wu didn't reveal that Lloyd had tampered with their stuff. Nia flexes with some pretty great intellect, which I applaud, and some other skills that are revealed later. What I love about this episode really though is the dynamics between the ninja, which are explored more. My two favorites have a great bromance and also the fun banter between Kai and Jay. Another key plot point is also explored, the Serpentine tribes uniting, the Fangblades, and the Great Devourer, which honestly, I definitely missed as a kid until way later. Also, I wonder why Kai is afraid of gingerbread men and elves. Whatever, the main thing is that's annoying to me is that Pythor was easy, easily able to just like snatch the sacred clue, but I guess if they were able to keep it, it would be too much of a power flex for the ninja. And I guess I also didn't realize that the ninja were high key preparing to die during this scene because of the log that they landed on that starts sinking into the acid and they would disintegrate. Huh, yeah, definitely did not catch that as a child, but I did, I did as an adult. <laughs> and they get saved by Samurai X, a new ally rival. I still don't understand why the Samurai, aka Nia, as we find out later, why the heck did she knock them out? Like, there's literally no need. I guess, other than to troll. <laughs> But we also get to see the city for the first time. The cursed city, might I add. But now with Pythor trying to unite the tribes, the ninja have to try to break up this union. And even though they do, they also get captured really fast. But the fact that Zane's pink G ends up saving his butt is actually gold. And he ends up saving everybody else. So, and the ninja are able to escape. 
and we get a short but enjoyable chase scene. If I had feet, ooh, I'd be trembling in my boots. The ninja managed to take their lesson from the beginning and use it against the serpent gene, which is nice to see, but unfortunately, Zane's G is no longer pink, and Cole gets pranked, ending the episode on a giddy note. Okay, since we're about at the halfway mark of my commentary, I'm gonna end this video here, just so I don't keep y'all here for too long, but I am super excited to talk about the rest of this season because I feel like the next episode is what really gets the snowball, the plot rolling. And also my voice hurts and I need a break. So toodaloo, we'll see you in the next video.